Okay, uh, so uh, hello. Uh, we would like to welcome uh, General Ben Hodges, who is uh, visiting Prague, and we had a chance to uh, speak with him about uh, important uh, matters concerning the war in uh, Ukraine or Russian aggression in Ukraine, mainly. General is uh, welcome in Prague once again, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, General Hodges is a retired uh, U.S. Uh, general, chief of uh, U.S. Uh, armies in Europe, in uh, NATO, and uh, currently he is working in Germany for uh, in a think tank in a German NGO sector and is quite active in German public discourse, if I understand it. Well, you also contribute to Bloomberg opinion uh, from time to time with an important uh, analysis. And uh, we would, uh, my name is Jan Macháček, I am chairman of the board of the Institute for Politics and Society, and Stepan Hobza is a reporter for Lidové Noviny. And we would uh, discuss these uh, matters with uh, General uh, together. So. Uh, first, I would like to ask you, General, everyone these days is uh, expecting and speaking about the uh, possible uh, Ukrainian offensive or counter-offensive. What are your estimates and uh, expectations uh, about this issue? Well, yeah, first let me say thanks for the opportunity uh, to speak with both of you and to uh, speak to a uh, uh, an important segment of Czech society. Um, uh, I am have been retired for five years, but my last job was commander of U.S. Army in Europe, uh, headquartered in Wiesbaden, Germany, and I still live in Germany, in Frankfurt. Um, I work for Human Rights First. Um, I'm also NATO senior mentor for logistics, and uh, I spend about 90% of my time in different things uh, advocating for the U.S. and Europe, U.S. and NATO, and helping Ukraine defeat Russia. Because I see Russia and by extension China as such a threat to all the values we care about in, in Europe. So, um, like everybody, I think uh, we've all been inspired by Ukrainian soldiers and people, their will, uh, their courage, uh, and the way they have stopped Russian forces. And if you, it's interesting if you think this war actually started in 2014. So after nine years, Russia only controls about 16% of Ukraine. Uh, but that includes the most important part, which is Crimea. Crimea is the decisive part, the decisive terrain of this war now. And I think that the Ukrainian general staff realizes that um, Ukraine will never be safe or secure as long as Russia occupies Crimea. Crimea is like a, a dagger that points into the belly of Ukraine as long as the Russian Navy sits in Sevastopol and Russian Air Force is able to fly out of Zhankoi and Saki and places like that. So I think that there is an offensive that's coming. Um, I don't know exactly when. But I think that this offensive will be aiming to isolate the Crimean Peninsula, to, to cut the land bridge that connects Crimea through Melitopol, Mariupol, back to Rostov. Um, I think that's actually the only part of Donbass that the Kremlin really cares about is the land bridge part. So uh, the eventual liberation of Crimea starts with an offensive that will cut that land bridge and begin to isolate it. So that's, of course, I don't know this, but I think that's the aim of this offensive. Um, Ukrainian general staff does a very good job of protecting information. I mean, we know more about the Russians than we do about the Ukrainians, which is as it should be. I should not know what the plan is or how many brigades they have or anything. Um, but I have been impressed with the general staff's abilities and their planning and how they, uh, how they do things. I think there are three conditions that have to be met, and then General Zaluzhny will turn to President Zelensky and say, we're ready to go. Uh, the first condition is, are Ukrainian forces ready? 
do you have enough combat power, enough armored brigades, enough artillery? Have they trained enough with all of this new equipment um, to be able to penetrate on a narrow front Russian defenses? They don't have to attack 900 miles, 150 kilometers, or 1,500 kilometers, excuse me. They just have to hit two or three places where they can penetrate all the way through to the Azov Sea. I think also, of course, probably they, w they would like to secure uh, the nuclear power plant at Japarizia before that becomes a disaster. But that's the first condition. Are Ukrainian forces strong enough and ready? The second condition, are the Russian forces confused and disrupted and degraded enough? So we've been watching now for the last few weeks, uh, fuel tanks uh, being destroyed, uh, ammunition being destroyed, uh, attacks on the infrastructure on the Russian side. Uh, there's panic among many of the Russian civilians that are being evacuated. Um, and the Russians are not sure when, where, or how this attack will happen. This is what we want, of course. So that's the second condition. The third condition, of course, is gonna be the ground. Um, is it sufficiently dry so that hundreds of armored vehicles can um, go over this ground without being stuck in the mud? Mm. So I think when they have those three conditions, own force, enemy force, and, and trafficability, then the general staff will tell the president, we're ready to go. I think this is still a few weeks away. The second condition that has something to do with the moment of surprise, if, if you will, yeah. is that true? Can you still achieve that moment of surprise, you know, after this heavy medialization of the whole thing? Because th this has been, you know, we have been speaking about this um, counteroffensive for three months now. So. Yeah, no, that's an that's a excellent point. And of course, um, the Ukrainians are aware of this. I mean, <laughs> they see all day, every day, Twitter, news reports, uh, professional journalists like, like you guys, uh, old people like me talking about it all the time. Um, and so I think what they, I'm sure what they're doing, of course, they'll use that. I mean, there's so many reports. The spring offensive, that's a creation of the public. Ukrainian general st staff never said, we're gonna do a spring offensive. They, I don't think they ever intended to tie it to the calendar or to a season. It's when the conditions are met, that's, which is how we would do it, when the conditions are met. Uh, of course, you have to find the balance. You can't wait forever. And you don't wanna give the Russians unlimited amounts of time to continue preparing. And it does make it harder to uh, preserve some surprise um, if, it, if it takes too long. So um, they will, I would expect, will do things to con continue to confuse uh, the Russian uh, general staff and the Russian commanders on the ground about where, when, and how. Um, typically, what we would be doing in phase one, or sometimes we even call it phase zero, is preparation. So to destroy fuel farms or to destroy bridges, whether those are partisans or drones or whatever, um, that's part of the shaping and the preparations. That, that's obviously already underway. How long does that go is, is not set to the calendar. It's more about have they accomplished what, what's needed. I think that the Russians are totally confused. I mean, they know somewhere within a, a few hundred kilometers, but they, they can't be sure. And so uh, there's an old uh, uh, Sun Tzu uh, says, um, he who would defend everything defends nothing. And, and so the Russians are really stretched thin. Yes, they have lots of trenches, but those are open ditches filled with very unhappy, unlucky hmm. Russian soldiers. Um, this will be difficult, it will be tough, there will be casualties. I think it could go very fast, so. If, may I? if you are the commanding officer of this operation, where would you strike? Where exactly? Um, I think that I would be looking for, for me, Crimea is the decisive terrain. Sure. So I, what can I do 
that most quickly isolates um, Crimea and enables me to bring up HIMARS and other weapons where I can start hitting the Crimean Peninsula. I mean, that's the goal, is to make Crimea untenable for Russian forces so that the Black Sea Fleet has to move. Uh, Russian Air Force cannot continue to launch missiles from there. Um, so whatever, wherever I can most quickly get close enough to the peninsula to start hitting those targets, um, that will be a part of it. But I also am very worried about Zaporizhia. Mm -hmm. I am absolutely, I would not spend more energy on Bakhmut beyond what they're already doing. I mean, this is bit, you could kill every Russian within 200 kilometers of Bakhmut. Yeah. That would not change the strategic outcome. Mm -hmm. Liberating Crimea changes everything. There is uh, another aspect uh, of, uh, of the predictability of uh, or surprise uh, in, in current warfare, especially this one, because uh, it's for the first time that everything is followed from not only from drones, but from very uh, precise satellite. Every, every movement mm -hmm. is uh, seen by both sides. In this respect, uh, strategists or military experts like you know very well, you cannot do like Napoleon, some from the left wing or a surprise or right wing, or even in the Second World War in much larger scale. So some people say that it's much more similar to the First World War in a way because it has to be like I know, like the trenches and iron against iron. Uh, what's your what's your take on this? Well, um, I will agree with the comparison to the First World War or even the Second World War in terms of the scale and the the terrible lethality, uh, the violence that's there, um, and it is steel on steel. I mean, at the end of the day, everybody wants a tank. I mean, tanks. The quality of tanks, of course, is, but it's still the, the concept of protected mobile firepower is about 100 years old. So, um, and that's still what, what's needed in, in this kind of a steel on steel conflict. Um, if one side has a tank, you better have a tank and lots of artillery, lots of so on. But I don't agree that uh, you can no longer surprise the enemy. Um, both sides know that of course there are satellites up there, there are drones everywhere. Drones are like hand grenades. I mean, they're everywhere and they're expendable. So we are all learning how to incorporate and integrate drone technology, whether it's for observation or uh, targeting or for delivering a, a weapon. Um, but because we know that, then you figure out, okay, how can I deceive the drones? Whether it's through decoys or showing a lot of different things, hiding in plain, in plain sight almost. Um, and, and of course the general staff, or, or excuse me, both sides also had the capability to blind. I mean, there is an extensive effort to counter hmm. drones, to knock them down not with kinetic, but with electronic means, digital means to break the link, for example. Um, and, and I think also with artificial intelligence, um, the ability to create fake pictures, the ability to create, to deceive is, is also growing. So I think uh, uh, there will be a lot of work. There is a lot of work being done to confuse about what's actually out there. And then finally, um, camouflage, you know, what uh, I was a lieutenant 45 years ago, you know, you, you would put things in your helmet, you conceal yourself from vision. Well, now, of course, you, everybody gives off a heat signature, a thermal signature. Drones can pick up that. So we now have uh, uniforms that have material that mm. conceals the heat signature. Mm. Uh, and, and the biggest signature comes from our communications. I mean, very easy to detect that. Okay. So learning how to mask that is, is also part of modern warfare. Mm -hmm.
let's get back to the, your first condition, you know, sufficient forces. For example, the American Abrams won't be available until early summer. Is that, is that about right? Um, it, it, um, I don't know the exact date when, when these uh, 31 Abrams tanks would be ready for combat. I, I don't know. We know for sure that Ukrainians are always faster at doing things than we thought they would be. Mm. So in terms of training and being ready, but I don't know where they are in the in the delivery process. Um, so I I don't assume that thir in 31 tanks is a is a battalion in, sure. in Ukrainian army organization. That's one battalion. I don't know that they'll be involved in the in the initial stages. Mm -hmm. No one knows the exact date, but I've heard that about now they are arriving to Rammstein, to Germany, so you must obviously train the crew and so on, so therefore my estimate. No, that, that could be. Um, I think that the uh, if you take an experienced tanker that already understands the concept of armored warfare, mm -hmm. right, and how to employ them, he's going to learn how to operate the actual tank faster mm -hmm than if somebody was a brand new soldier taken off the street. So I, I anticipate they'll learn quickly. Um, a key for the Abrams, though, of course, will be, do they have the fuel, uh, the maintenance, uh, all of those things. Hmm. Um, who knows where those Abrams will turn up? Um, same thing with the Leos and uh, the other systems. My guess is that there are several brigades hmm. that are equipped with Western tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, check artillery. I mean, the general staff will have figured out how do we get the most effect out of all these systems, but in a way that is sustainable. Hmm. I mean, when you have uh, so many different types of, of vehicles in, in one unit, it, maintenance is very difficult because you have to have different parts sure. for all the different, so you, you try to have common vehicles in each unit. So I think they will have, they will have figured out how to do that. Let's uh, speak a little bit about the mood uh, uh, and support in the West and in the US. Starting with the US, there are some uh, people who are uh, saying, look, uh, our uh, goals are basically more or less fulfilled in, uh, in this uh, conflict. Russia is absolutely weakened from their point of view and it will not have resources and will for some even more western expansion in let's say next 10 years 15 years uh, it uh, the uh, nato is revived uh, european members are finally taking their armament and fulfilling the goals seriously look at poland etc and uh, the as Americans uh, export more energies into Europe, so our strategic goals are fulfilled. So shouldn't we focus more on China, etc.? So what's your take on this? So th this is the classic uh, issue here that uh, is discussed a lot inside Washington as well as Berlin and Paris and I assume Prague uh, and in London. I would not separate China from this, this Russo-Ukrainian war, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is connected to China because um, China is watching to see, are we willing to stick together to do what's necessary? That's number one. Uh, I think China probably is not happy with Russia because this war did wake us up and all of us are, we're improving our relationships, so we're, we're growing capability, producing ammunition, having to, uh, and uh, of course a lot, a lot of that's going to happen right here in the Czech Republic and, and with Slovakia to become once again one of the main producers of uh, armaments, uh, which the West needs. Um, but I think my president, who has done a very good job so far keeping everybody I mean, 50 nations supporting Ukraine, it's incredible. And so I think President Biden probably didn't anticipate or didn't want this war, but you know, when you're president, things are presented to you. Um, the area where I would, uh, where I am critical 
is that he has not said what our strategic goals are. It's, it's not clear that he wants Ukraine to win. Um, he does say things like, we're with Ukraine for as long as it takes. Right. For as long as what takes. I mean, what, what does that mean? I think this is an empty statement. But it's one that's also used in Berlin and in London and everywhere else for as long as it takes. That's, that's not a strategic outcome, though. Um, I think that there is reluctance to actually say we want Ukraine to win. Win means Ukraine gets all their territory back. Crimea, Donbass, all of their sovereign territory. It means that there is accountability for Russian war crimes. It means that there will be, let's get these thousands of children back home to Ukraine. Uh, and it also means some sort of security guarantee or some relationship until Ukraine finally becomes a member of NATO and the EU. And I think my president and his administration are reluctant uh, to say that. Why? I think it's either, and this is only my analysis, I don't know this. I think it's either because they are, that China is communicating, we do not want to see Russia humiliated and, and, and the Federation collapse. So losing Crimea, for example, could lead to uh, a, a major uh, defeat. It would lead to a major defeat of Russia. What, what are the implications of that? And I think the Chinese would prefer, not because they love Russia, they don't, but they prefer some sort of status quo. So I think the Chinese are probably communicating this to the, uh, to the uh, administration. Or I think there is an exaggerated concern over Russia using a nuclear weapon. That if it comes down to it, if Ukraine is being too successful and they're about to take Crimea, which I think they will, I think the administration believes that President Putin might actually use a nuclear weapon. I don't believe he will. In fact, I'm sure he won't, but the administration does. And so that's why they stopped short of saying, we want Ukraine to win. So that, that was a long answer to your good question, but, but I don't think we have clearly defined strategic goals yet. I, I was gonna ask about the nuclear weapon, you know, because um, there are these estimates that Crimea would be a reason enough for Putin to use it. So. Why do you believe he will not? Yeah, so I hear this also, but this is what self-deterrence looks like. I mean, they, they have threatened to use a nuclear weapon since we provided Javelin, Stinger, HIMARS, pay, I mean, every time they say, oh, that's it, and then nothing happens because they really can't do anything. They can't, the Russians have not been able to destroy a single train, not one train coming from Poland with ammunition or equipment, not one convoy. They don't have the ability to hit a moving target. They have failed to achieve air superiority. How can that be? They have a gigantic advantage in numbers of aircraft because air superiority is not just about numbers of airplanes, it's about all, of, it's an operation to eliminate air defense, eliminate the enemy's air and, and so on. They, can't, they couldn't do it. And so all of these threats about what they might do have been empty threats, but they see that we stop or hesitate. You remember when uh, they announced that they were gonna move one of their tactical nuclear weapons into Belarus. Everybody was like, oh my God, that, that meant zero. That meant nothing. It did not do anything to make it more likely that they might use it. You don't have to drive closer like in the old days. <laughs> But, but, they, but by saying this, it got everybody thinking, oh my gosh, he might use a nuclear weapon. Um, so I think my president has said, if you use a nuclear weapon, there will be catastrophic consequences for Russia. That doesn't mean in Russia. In fact, I'm sure we would not use a nuclear weapon or anything inside Russia because that changes the nature of things. But I could imagine um, catastrophic consequences for meaning the Black Sea Fleet, mm. or Russian forces inside Ukraine. One last thing, and I'm glad you asked this. Um, I think our open liberal democratic societies need to have a grown-up conversation about what does using a nuke mean? 
Okay, I think most people have in their mind uh, this terrible vision like uh, of Hiroshima, Nagasaki, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of a thing, okay? Those are possible, uh, but those would be from the intercontinental ballistic missiles, yes. you know, huge payload that the, that the Soviets had to use against the U.S. and that we had to use against them for deterrence. That's, that kind of weapon would only be used against us. The Kremlin's not going to do that because they know what would happen sure. immediately. So then you've got the category of tactical nuclear weapon that can be delivered from an airplane or a rocket launcher or uh, different means, a much smaller yield. Um, during the Cold War, the Soviets had tactical nuclear weapons that would be used to create a gap in NATO defenses and then they had troops in uh, Soviet uh, military and Warsaw Pact military that had the proper equipment and training to operate in a contaminated environment where they would drive through this gap. Mm. All right. That doesn't exist anymore. They don't have that capability anymore. Mm. So it, it, there's, no, there's no benefit, there's no advantage for Russia to use a nuclear weapon of any, of any type. The Ukrainians are not going to stop. If Russia uses a nuclear, they're not going to stop. I mean, they know what happens now when you're under the thumb of the Russian military. So I think um, that the likelihood, I, and also we know that the Chinese have said, do not, absolutely do not. Hmm. So I think for Russia, their nuclear weapons are really only effective when they don't use them. Because once they use them, that's over. Hmm. Okay, that is. Uh also, uh, 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 for some reason, uh, you, you mentioned uh, Russian air aircraft and equipment. If you remember at the beginning of the war, there was a call for creating a no-fly zone over the Ukraine. But in reality, there is a no-fly zone because Russian aircraft is not entering the sky o over the Ukraine. They are only shooting from around uh, from Caspian Sea, Black Sea, from the Belarus, from here and there. Why, why don't they use, uh, are they really so much afraid of the efficiency of Ukrainian air defense or what's your, uh, what's your... Yeah, they, um, again, the Russian Air Force, let me say it this way, I completely overestimated Russia's military capability before the war. I'm professionally, I'm embarrassed that I was so wrong. Mm. And I've tried to figure out why was I so wrong? And, and what I failed to appreciate was the depth and impact of corruption inside the Ministry of Defense. Mm. I mean, false numbers, poor quality equipment. Um, they didn't they didn't get, the Russian taxpayer did not get what they paid for in terms of quality equipment, ammunition storage, these kinds of things. Instead, officials like Minister Shoigu got very, very rich uh, because of this. So that, that system has resulted in uh, less quality and less numbers than what I had anticipated. Certainly they have um, some very good things and you know, their long range rockets and artillery, always a strong part of the Russian military, uh, also electronic warfare capability, it's the best. Uh, but otherwise, I mean, they're, uh, they're t the Armada tank was supposed to be this, it's, it's having zero effect on the battlefield. Hmm. The second thing that I missed was uh, their exercises. They do not train to the point of failure. And they're more like, um, demonstrations, mm -hmm. and they can move a lot of stuff. That always impressed me. But if you don't exer do an exercise where you fail, mm -hmm. then you, you never learn and you never get better. Mm -hmm. But their exercises have not pushed them to develop what they really need. And then finally, they don't have any real operational experience. As I, what I missed from Georgia to Syria to Crimea, Africa, it's actually a very small part of the military ever did this. Hmm. Most of the military never left Russia. And so if you don't do real exercises and if you're corrupt and you don't have experience, then you do stupid things like this 50 kilometer convoy on one road, you know, like that. Um, all the videos we see of tanks getting destroyed, 
are tanks that should be destroyed because they're sitting out in the open. They're not properly employed. They're not protected with infantry. Uh, and so I started looking at these things like, wow, this is, they're totally unprepared. Hmm. And then for the Air Force, you know, our Air Force, NATO Air Forces, day one, you, you cut the head off of the enemy's command and control, right? Uh, I remember when President Zelensky came out like on the second or third morning with his phone and he said, hey, I'm still here. I thought, oh, that is cool. Like, how is his phone working? I couldn't believe his phone was working. This is, this is what I mean, that the Russians failed to do what we would consider a basic thing, to cut the head off of the leadership, at least their communication, um, and to get air superiority, which means you have to destroy enemy air defense, you have to destroy enemy airfields, you have to destroy the command and control, and then you own the sky. Why, why was Russia not able to do that? Because they've never trained to do that. Flying in Syria is nothing compared to flying over Ukraine. So yes, they're terrified of going there. The great Russian Black Sea Fleet, they're terrified of going anywhere close to the Ukrainian coastline ever since the Moskva was sunk. And Ukraine doesn't even have a navy. But, you, but, the, but the Russian Navy does not want to go anywhere near there because they're not trained. And, and so um, th that, that's, that's how I would answer that question. How much, uh, so they're looking at your watches, how much time? I've got have? about 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes, okay, so. Uh, I was gonna ask about, I was gonna ask about this underestimation because you obviously weren't the only expert who under, uh, or, sorry, overestimated the Russian capabilities, but if we only have 10 minutes, let's get back to Europe and particularly Germany because you live in Germany and you know, we spoke about the new armament, new sense of armament in NATO. How about Germany because they have this one 100 billion euro package, but you know, um, the results are mixed, if that's fair to say. Yeah, sure. So the Zeitenwende um, is not just about 100 billion, it's also, you have to have a Zeitenwende up here okay. in your head. Um, and I think that Germany is, I mean, we're having to undo decades of, you know, don't want to do this, yeah. uh, Chancellor Schultz, um, who I think deserves credit for, even though it's against everything that he has always believed, he recognizes as a leader of the German Federal Republic and as a NATO ally and a leader inside the European Union. Um, and Germans always talk about never again. Mm. You know, mm. uh, I think he recognizes that Germany is in danger of losing its moral authority if it doesn't stop. Um, help Ukraine stop Russia. So, uh, and, and when, I, when I listen to my German neighbors and friends, more and more people are saying, what, what's wrong with the Bundeswehr? We got to get better again. Hmm. We, we need to be prepared to do our part. Yes. And, uh, but there is an uneasiness. People are concerned, uh, especially frankly, older Germans like, oh my God, we don't want to get into a war again. We've hmm. done that. There's this guilt that pervades uh, a lot of the conversation. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, the younger generation, and when I think about uh, um, people like Mr. Pistorius, who is younger than me, uh, or Frau Baerbach, I mean, they, we are lucky that Germany has Pistorius and Baerbach as the uh, defense minister and foreign minister. I mean, they, they have a realistic view of the world. They understand who Russia is. And so I, I'm confident, and I do know most of the German officers who lead the Bundeswehr, they know how to do this. They just, they need the, the political guidance and the political push to do what needs to be done. But uh, on the other hand, there is uh, a number of uh, German Germans who believe that this, uh, if I quote it exactly, that, that the diplomatic, uh, tools to end this war are not used enough. Like 57% of Germans currently believe that this war should be solved in through diplomacy. You know, like it's always sensitive with the polls and how questions are uh, formulated. But anyway, uh, what's, uh, you are also, uh, is it right that you also meet with the Chancellor of, uh, Schultz, uh, and are you being his informal advisor or you are just friends? Or? 
I've, I've never met the Bundes Chancellor. I no? would, uh, okay. I would love to. Uh, <laughs> we can arrange. It. Yeah, please do. <laughs> um, so no, I, I don't have a, a, any sort of official relationship to the German government oh, at all. Um, but I do. Uh, I reach out to the German public Opinion. as much as I can. Yeah. Uh, through different types of media uh, and through members of the Bundestag who, whom I have met um, because what Germany does is so important for all of Europe. It's important for the United States. And so, um, yeah, of course, there are, there are large numbers of Germans that are, for whatever reason, of, of different reasons, are like really don't want to go down this road of having to be strong militarily again I think this is changing. And I mean, look, Russia invaded uh, Georgia in 2008. We, we, the collective, we did zero. Uh, they invaded uh, Crimea in 2014. And then this whole Minsk process started. So for eight years, there were some sanctions, but not nothing that changed behavior. This Minsk process went on and on and on so-called ceasefire, but these were empty. And so um, I would say that diplomacy has been tried, but the Russians, of course, could see that there was nothing behind it. I mean, Frederick the Great said, uh, diplomacy without weapons is like an orchestra without instruments. <laughs> and uh, if you can't back it up with serious uh, diplomatic power that's not backed up by economic power. I mean, Germany was still building Nord Stream 2 up until the end of 2021. <laughs> so don't tell me about diplomacy if you're still pumping hundreds of billions of euro into the Russian treasury. Um, so I, I think we, we, the reason we're in a terrible war now is because we did not use strong diplomacy backed up by economic power and military power. Perhaps last my last question. We overestimated Russia for sure. Did we also underestimate the Ukrainians, and can we learn from them now? You know, including U.S. military. Yeah, yeah it's actually. I would even supplement this uh, question a little bit. It seems there is a lot of talk about that Ukrainians need uh, training, uh, technically, obviously, but the sooner or later it will be the Ukrainians who will be training us Europeans because they are the only ones who have direct experience with the current warfare, even like technologically, mm -hmm. drones, AI, everything, satellites uh, being uh, in the field, like, uh, so yeah. that's a supplement to the question. So uh, Ukraine already is the strongest, biggest army in Europe. I mean, they are. Um, and uh, we are indeed learning a lot from them. Now, um, I've never seen soldiers that are able to learn and adapt new technologies faster than Ukrainians. No American, not British, not German, not Czech, nobody. Um, of course, they're motivated because they're defending their country. Um, and there's a, uh, um, you'll, you'll, you'll know that, the, that Ukraine was the heart of the defense industry of the Soviet Union. I mean, that's where most of the engineering and technology really took place anyway, was in Ukraine. So there is a, a residual um, engineering sense, I think, in Ukraine. But also, uh, they, because they've had to grow their army so fast, they, they don't have so many of the bureaucratic stovepipes that we do, so innovation kind of, it just uh, accelerates so quickly and, and they're trying all kinds of different things. So there's a culture inside the government and inside the Ministry of Defense that encourages that. They have moved away, they've abandoned the old Soviet model of top-down centralized control and planning. Instead, they have unleashed the, um, the talent and potential of young people and um, have made it easier to do things like that. I think this is part of the reason that they have been uh, as successful um, as they've been. 
of course what the West provides and the Czech Republic was one of the very first to start providing real capability um, that, that this has been essential for them there, there's no doubt but at the end of the day there's no weapon that wins a war it's it's a man and a woman uh, that's their brain that that's what and their heart that's what makes a difference mm. thank you Ben this has been excellent Oh, my privilege. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity.